Hi guys, welcome back. Thanks for joining me for another Royal News video. So I'm back. Spain was absolutely fantastic. Valencia is a beautiful city. I will say if you've ever thought about going, it's on a bucket list, you're just not quite sure, do it. There's so much to do, there's so much to see, there's so much to eat. But yes, I'm feeling very, very well rested and I'm ready to jump back into the royal fishbowl of news and of course, drama. But the drama comes from the drama llamas of Montecito. So there's lots of stuff obviously I've missed out on. I'm doing lots of videos this week and I will incorporate some of the stuff that I've missed in with the current news. There is a big story, as I mentioned on the community page, to do with the Pat Tillman Award that I promise you is going to be my next video. It's a big story and I think it deserves a video all on its own to cover that, especially when Pat Tillman's own family are not happy about Harry receiving the award. But save your comments for that one and that will be coming to you tomorrow. But for today, let's talk about, well, let's start with some real royals. Princess Anne had a lucky escape, it would seem. She got KO'd by one of her horses and ended up having a five-day hospital stay. There were a few media outlets that were trying to say, oh, it's, it's a lot worse than what they're letting on. Drama, drama, drama. And at the end of the day, she's 73 years old. She got kicked in the head by a horse. I don't know if any of you have ever been kicked by a horse. They hurt a lot. And you can imagine Princess Anne being such a strong and talented equestrian woman. She doesn't have just tiny little ponies. She's probably got some of the best of the best strong horses. So I'm glad that she made a speedy recovery. It was nice to see Sir Admiral Timothy Lawrence. These titles sometimes are so big. I'm trying to not blah, blah, blah. Her husband paid a visit to Princess Anne and took her some bits and bobs in and apparently was even taking her in some food. So it goes to show, even if you're a princess and you're in a nice posh hospital or whether you are just going into an NHS hospital, it would seem that hospital food seems to suck regardless. Now, in some more royal news, we've had Princess Beatrice, who actually stepped in for Prince William to do with the Earthshot Prize. There was an event that was held and Princess Beatrice went in his stead. This, to me, is further confirmation that Princess Beatrice is being lined up to be a working royal. I don't know if they will take her on as full time, but I think that they are really beginning to see that she has got great potential. She's likeable. Everybody likes her. And I think that they do need more feet on the ground. It has been one of the worst flukes to have the King and Catherine with cancer at the same time. But obviously then when we have Princess Anne being kicked in the head by a horse, then you've also got we don't have enough royals left to carry out so many engagements and the royals do have a lot of charities and a lot of foundations plus a lot of personal projects that they are working on. So I do think that they need to consider that they need some of the younger royals who are willing to take up some of the, some of the reins, I suppose, especially at the moment where Catherine is still going through her cancer treatment. Many people have said that they really like Mike and Zara as well, and I could definitely see them having a couple of sporting patronages. They've got the right sort of attitudes, the right level of fun, and very much like Princess Beatrice, they are incredibly loyal to their families. Princess Beatrice was very close with Prince Philip and of course Queen Elizabeth. She's always stayed incredibly loyal to her family and generally when you see her at any sort of public events and engagements, Beatrice comes across as likeable, as very sweet and the public have definitely warmed to her. Now, moving on over, let's get the Montecito stuff out of the way because there's been some pretty major headlines. Obviously, you've got the Pat Tillman Award fallout, but then you've also got Harry has apparently been destroying evidence in his own court case right? But before, literally 24 hours before that story broke, Harry pops up using Scotty's little soldiers. Now, Harry had this interview filmed, obviously, when he came over for the Invictus Games. So you know how many weeks ago that was. And miraculously, before this story breaks, this just comes out of thin air. And it's Harry talking about his grief of losing his mother. Yes, it's the old Diana card mixed in with the veteran card and the fact that this is to do, Scotty's Little Soldiers is to do with children that are grieving for parents that have been killed in action. For Harry, this is like the holy trifecta, isn't it? This is every point of that triangle has been touched on. Now, this is not me knocking Scotty's Little Soldiers. Please don't anybody say anything negative to the charity. It is a wonderful charity and it does good things to help children, but I cannot help but feel 
feel that Harry is just using it. The same as he uses Diana. It's all to do with deflection because I find it way too convenient that this interview just suddenly popped up the night before a big story like that broke. It was 26 years ago he lost Diana and I'm not saying that his or Prince William's pain of losing their mother under such tragic circumstances should be any less but you move forward with it. In fact, the actual interview to do with Harry and Nikki Scott was called Grief to Growth. And I'm not seeing any growth, any personal growth with Harry. If anything, I think he's regressed now, worse than what he was when he was in his 20s trying to fight photographers and was taking drugs. And I think I know the reason why. Yes, it must be very hard for someone to move forward when you've got a wife who is tapping into those memories. Meghan communing with Diana, putting her hands on her tombstone and talking to her, dressing like her, acting like her. She's really twisted Harry's noodle and it's like she's done it, she's seen the wound and she's opened it up and she's stuck her thumb in. And the reason why she's done that, it was to make Harry malleable. It's to make him moldable because all she had to do was to connect Harry's association to her with his mother, the loss of his mother, and then she had him hook, line and sinker. This is why Meghan threatened to leave him if he didn't go serious about their relationship. This is why Meghan threatened to kill herself. But then she said, I couldn't do it because obviously you can't lose another woman in your life. Well, you've just sat there telling him that you're gonna kill yourself, your unborn child, and then go, oh, but you know what, I'm not because you know, your mum. I mean, this is levels of manipulation that are absolutely disgusting. And it has been confirmed in Spare, this is Harry's own words. And I tell you what, Spare's getting that boy into a lot of trouble. But before I get onto that part of the story, when we look back at Harry when, well, let's just say pre Megan, he was a happier soul in general. Now, I'm not saying that Harry clearly wasn't a jerk and didn't have some anger issues because the stuff that we've learned about Harry from his own mouth in recent years shows that he's obviously always been jealous, spoilt, entitled, vengeful, and very, very immature. But there were also a nice side to him. There were nicer sides to him. There was a fun side to him. He was likeable. He was chatty. He was funny. And the thing is, when he and William used to talk about Princess Diana together with joint interviews, they did a lovely one with Catherine. I used to sit there and enjoy listening to them both because they were talking about positive memories and the things that their mother would want for them. And it was it was sad in so many ways. Of course it is. It's awful that they lost their mum so young. But William and Harry were a positive force to helping children like Scotty's soldiers because they could show that if they could get past it, all right, they had a lot of help, they had a loving family, they had access to the best money and therapy they could, but they also went through their grief every day in newspapers, on TVs. They had everybody gawking at them and it must have been truly awful. But this was the old Harry. The new Harry that we've got is all despair and suffering and a cycle of pain. That to me is not someone that has had any sort of mental growth. That is not someone to me that seems to have had decent therapy. As I said, Harry seems to have gone backwards. Yes, I do believe that Harry uses Diana as a card because he has it has allowed him to get away with a lot of stuff growing up because he lost his mum, because he was that 12 year old boy walking behind his mum's coffin. We have had years of this. And the thing is, it's now become very tiresome because he uses Diana memory and like this as I said you had a negative story coming out up pops Harry veterans Princess Diana and then mental health these are the three things that Harry just throws out there as a bit of a buffer the utter hypocrisy of when he went to another award show that he didn't deserve the aviation legends of aviation and he had the cheek to try and humiliate John Travolta on stage by saying to the crowd, oh, were well, you dined out on dancing with my mother? It wasn't cute, it wasn't funny, it was rude. And it sounded to me a little bit possessive over his mother's memory. Even the Diana Awards recently, he allowed Meghan to launch RO to try and get attention away from it. Not that I think that he has any control over what Meghan does, but he was also part of, I think it was an Archwell Award that got shown round about the same time. Not only that, the recipients of the Diana Awards were celebrating. They were all up in London. They'd flown some of them from different countries around the world. They had their family members. 
because of his pettiness and the fallout with Prince William, he decided that he wanted everyone to go back to the hotel so he could do a video call and he was late. He didn't do the Diana Awards video call till I think it was gone midnight, near enough one o'clock in the morning. Where was Harry? Why was he so late? Oh, he's at a posh ski lodge with Corey Gamble, which is Kim Kardashian's stepdad or something. That's Harry's priorities. But yes, when it suits, he can use the Diana card. Harry is gradually souring Diana's legacy because of his constant association to his mother with this pity party and then of course to Meghan. And on top of this, if I'm really truly honest with you guys, I listened to Spare because there was some of the stuff, I didn't listen to all of it, God forbid, but there were certain things where the newspapers were talking about what he'd said and Harry always says, oh, the media manipulates it, they've twisted it. You can't twist listening to Spare with Harry's own voice. And after I went through the Elizabeth Arden cream, him thinking of mummy's lips as he put the cream on his penis, I'll tell you, I was the one needing therapy after that. There are so many things that Harry said in that book to do with his mother that for me comes across as unstable. I would possibly say he needs a different sort of therapy than grief counselling. And the, the hair on the side of the bed, asking mummy to make the pregnancy tests turn positive as he took a nap, getting Megan to commune to her, speaking to her through mediums and stuff. I mean, there's just so much stuff where I wouldn't be shocked if he sometimes calls Megan mummy. It's a, got a very Norman Bates sort of vibe to it now. And it left people, it just I, it felt a bit dirty. It felt a bit unsavoury. And it certainly caused a lot of ridicule as well. Prince William must be absolutely bloody furious with him over that. But it does make me wonder if that was the stuff that was left in the book, what stuff did they cut out of it? Because if you remember, it was released at the time that there were several copies of the book that they had turned around and said, that's got to go, that's got to go. Harry bragged about it like, I've got enough for a second volume of Spare and a little bit of a threat towards his family again. He apparently had enough for volume two, but that may have all changed because of Harry destroying the evidence for this current court case. Harry has reportedly destroyed all correspondence with Mr. Mooringer, the ghostwriter for his book. Harry has apparently destroyed every single tiny piece of communication and then what he hasn't destroyed, he no longer has access to. Bit convenient, isn't it? In a truly gobsmacking story, Harry has reportedly deliberately destroyed potential evidence relating to his high court phone hacking claim against NGN newsgroup newspapers. Lawyers for NGN wanted to have access to emails, to two encrypted hard drives, texts, WhatsApp messages, various communications between Harry and J.R. Moringer. This is because both Harry and J.R. Moringer had been quite open about the amount that they had spoken, had texted each other around the clock and various Zoom calls over the course, I think it was two years, and it's highly likely that they would have been discussing the unlawful behaviour by the newspapers. So naturally, NGN wants to know exactly what Harry was telling his ghostwriter. What evidence did he have in there? What information went back and forth between them? Well, now, according to Harry's legal team, David Sherborn, the man that is single-handedly getting richer by the day just by having Harry as one of his clients, he has said that all communications, all research, all drafts of the manuscripts are gone. Tapes, digital copies, WhatsApp, Zoom, backups, hard drives, email addresses, everything has been wiped, everything is deleted, access is not available. Is he Ethan Hawke? Did everything just self-destruct after Harry had decided that he was done with it, the book had been printed? It reminds me of when Meghan, with her court case, she said, oh no, sorry, I don't have access to any of my text messages or WhatsApp because the palace wipes everything clean for security. Yeah, we didn't believe that then and we don't believe that now. One of the many major issues that I'm struggling to believe this story is the fact that J.R. Moringer does not have copies of everything. He apparently has deleted it all as well. And I'm sorry, that's just not believable. The stories, the things that he put in that book legally, his 
but needs to be covered in every way possible. You know the stuff that came out in that book. There is no way that Penguin Publishers would not have copies of everything, every single draft, notes, because of lawsuits. With all of the scandalous stories and accusations, J.R. Moringer would have had to make sure that he has got enough stuff that if Harry decided to turn around and say, I never said that, I never put that in the book, like Omid Scobie did, exactly like Omid Scobie did with Endgame, I never put the names in there. He even tried to ruin two women translators' careers in Holland by saying that they must have put the names in the books. Well, he implied that, which is disgusting because later on the slippery snake then had to say, oh, it was in a draft that shouldn't have gone. So you did put those names in a book at some point. So of course, it wouldn't have been surprising or that shocking when the backlash started happening that Harry didn't turn around and say, well, I never said such a thing. He must have put that in there. So I do not believe for one second that there are not copies. And in another embarrassing twist for Harry's legal team, and of course, Harry, two hard drives they were after, right? They apparently contained documents from his staff's shared drive and they disappeared. They couldn't be located. They'd been destroyed. They'd been wiped. They were gone. Well, on the morning of Thursday's hearing, they miraculously got found. One was found in Harry's US lawyer's office and the other one was found in Harry's house. He's in the middle of a court case where he's been asked to provide evidence and he didn't think to look in his US lawyer's office or in his own home. Yeah, it's very, very hard pill to swallow and I don't think the judge is gonna let this go easily. NGN lawyers have turned around and said that Harry is creating a deliberate obstacle course. They practically had to drag him kicking and screaming to give any of the information over. They did try and say that Harry has deliberately destroyed evidence, but Justice Van Court did shut that down and said, we don't know at this point. But he did also state, I have seen troubling evidence that a large number of potentially relevant documents and confidential messages between Harry and his ghostwriter J.R. Moringer have been wiped. And the claimant must make a witness statement on how the deletion of the messages and destruction of the drafts took place after the commencement of these proceedings. Who's Harry going to blame this time? He certainly can't blame palace courtiers and palace security for wiping everything. Now it gets better. Justice Fancourt has also turned around and said that the way Harry's legal team are getting the documentation together is not appropriate. Do you want to know why? Because they're relying on Prince Harry to pull together the documentation that's been requested. I kid you not. The majority of the searching for and selection of documents to disclose has been dealt with by the Duke himself. His lawyers tried to say Harry is an old hand at dealing with disclosure because of his previous litigations. Oh, let's start with this one. Do you mean the litigations where Harry stood on the stand and said it's not his job to provide evidence? Do you mean the litigations where Harry basically said he doesn't need to give evidence because he felt those things happened? Do you mean the, the litigations that he had to pull out of because the day before, I think it was, wasn't it the mail on Sunday to do with his um, security case being called out? He turned around and said, oh, actually, no, I've, I've had to withdraw from that. Why? Because Harry didn't have any evidence. It's absolutely ridiculous to trust Harry to do anything. I wouldn't trust that man to read the weather reports to me, let alone to be able to obtain documentation that the other team want for their lawyers. But it gets better because even Justice Fancourt is basically, I would say, he's had enough of the bullshit because he does an epic slapdown. Listen to this. Sometimes I have the impression in this claim that even the claimant's lawyers don't seem to fully grapple with the knowledge issue despite it being spelled out in the defendant's correspondence. It would be not all surprising if the claimant himself didn't fully understand. Basically, he's saying that if you, the lawyers, don't even understand half of this case or what is being asked of you, how do you expect Harry to know? Yes, it's, it's as I said, bamboozling at this point. The judge must have a bottle of whiskey under his desk. 
I honestly don't know how Harry can continue on this path of bringing these lawsuits if this is the level of his A game, because it's certainly not doing him any favours or credibility with any of these judges. The only winners in this are the lawyers. But I reckon anyone else that signed up to these joint court cases is kicking themselves that we went along with Harry, because it turns out he's possibly more destructive to the court cases than what any evidence is. Clearly Harry is hiding stuff, it's pretty obvious. The thing is with Harry, this is backfiring on him big time because of everything that he said in previous court cases and now this, being accused of damaging or losing or hiding evidence is really, really bad. He and his lawyers have been hit with a 60K fine to be awarded to NGN because of all of the extra work that they are making them do. But I honestly cannot see that this judge is gonna put up with much more of Harry dragging his heels. Harry was the one that decided he wanted to play big boy and he wanted to take his lawyers and he wanted to battle the media. He was going to go in and slay dragons. The only thing that he seems to be single-handedly slaying is his own reputation and credibility. It would certainly seem to me that Harry's insistence on writing this memoir, Harry's raw truth, his journey from the prince he was born to the man that he has become, may actually end up being his undoing. But I feel no sympathy, naturally, in any of this, because he wrote that book to cause maximum damage, hurt and destruction to his family. And it seems that the only person that Harry is causing destruction to is himself. And I can't help but feel that that's just a little bit of divine karma at this point. So guys, that's it for me on this video. I will be back with you tomorrow where we have got lots to discuss. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll chat to you in the comments and I will see you soon. Take care for now. Bye.